So there's always stuff in life. And then Gail and I have uh, begun, like intentionally, we don't do this in a systematic way. We do it in a spontaneous way, which is to say when we have things that are, that are eating our lunch, we just start praying about them and agreeing about them and openly. And we've really begun to list some things. And um, it's been amazing that as we have agreed in prayer, and I'm talking about, boom, answers now. And I'm saying this to encourage you because I believe that, that, that we're serving a God who, who uh, answers prayer, loves to answer prayer, and we need to celebrate when he's answering our prayers. And so this poor man cried and the Lord heard me, all right? So in these prayers of agreement, it's a good thing for me like right now when I'm, when I'm moving into um, talking about marriage. There is no place of agreement that's more powerful than the marriage covenant. Amen? So those of us who are married, we have, uh, we have supercharged grace on us. If you're not married, you're not lacking in grace. Don't get the wrong idea. But we have, uh, we have agreement that we've been working on for a long time so that it comes real quickly to be able to, to have complete harmony. All right, so go for that. Now, we also come to live in a world. I'm, I'm, I'm fixing to preach now. We've come to live in a world. And I, have to be, I want to be real careful tonight that <clears throat> the spirit of political correctness has so filled our atmosphere that, um, I mean, just like every time you single anybody out, you're in trouble by everybody else. That is not going to be the way we operate here in this house. Okay, let's just don't. Let's just don't. And you're not going to get an offended spirit when somebody's being talked to specifically, and you're not. Because that's not how we operate, because God doesn't leave anybody out in his family. And so we don't, I don't want a house where Mother's Day, you can't talk about Mother's Day because somebody's not a mother. Stop it. <laughs> and tonight we're not going to have talking about marriage where you can't talk about marriage because somebody's not married. Because guess what? We're going to talk about divorce. Uh-oh. So we're going to do that too, because it's, it, it's there in the Bible. These are the things where you open your Bible and you have to do it because it's right there in the Bible. So I'm going to open the Word of God. I'm going to read the passage over you, and uh, I'm going to have us, hallelujah, do something that's traditional in a lot of high church settings. I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the word. I'm going to read the whole text. Don't bother with my slides. I'll get to my slides. Matthew chapter 19, the gospel according to Matthew and chapter 19. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Understand this, we're moving from we're moving from the Galilean hill country, we're moving into Judea, the capital city. We're moving we're moving toward where things are going to come to a head. And large crowds followed him and he healed them there. And the Pharisees came to him and tested him by asking, "Is it lawful for to divorce one's wife for any cause?" He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, well, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you 
to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive the saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been, from, been so from birth. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this saying, receive it. Then the children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. And now I'm going to do what I do at the end of the service because you need it now. And now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. So that this word from the Lord will be received in the place of peace. Amen. 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 Be seated. All right. This is the Lord's word. And we receive it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's talk about family ties. And I'm, I'm, I'm so I'm so low on time. By the way, uh, a little a little quick word. Number one, I'm preaching this message for you and they're not getting it in the morning because I'm not going to be here. Chuck's preaching on family in the morning, so they'll get a good word there. I'm about to get on a plane and go to Brazil and visit our family there, the Billmans, and uh, take the word of the Lord there and do some recording for Mama Heidi Baker and uh, fulfill some promises. And um, I told the church last week that we're, listen, we're really entering into the process of, of um, raising up generations. Um, I, I was glad I got a message from one of Anthony's old childhood friends wanting his message from last week. And then just before I came in here, I got a response. He said, does he do that a lot? He killed it. <laughs> right? Right? Okay, so in the next um, few weeks, in fact, for most of the season leading up to Christmas, your pastor's going to be out of the pulpit. I'm going ahead and squeezing this one in here because, you know, you don't preach on divorce and remarriage during the holidays. <laughs> I says, don't do that. And um, also because I am going to be traveling a bit. Um, but this house is well, well served. We've gone way past the time that when, when, the, when the father of the house was gone, that there was a concern about the momentum of the family. No concern here. This family's in good hands. We're well served. We have a team. We got horses in the stall. Right? So they're going to get loose. Now, I want to be sure you understand one more thing real, really, really clearly. I ain't going nowhere. So pastor saying he's passing things off. He ain't leaving. Okay? And I used ain't because ain't is my emphasis word. I'm from the south. And... Uh, so, so don't, don't get stirred up and, and concerned there. I know what I carry, and I know what I'm supposed to do in these, in these coming days, and I'm not finished. I have a lot of promises to keep and a lot of impartation to release, uh, and, I, and I, have, I have word in me that has to, that has to come out. 
So family ties, the problem of broken marriage relationships. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, what sayings? Just remember the sayings before I've told you were about family ties. I'm going to review them just for a quick second. He went away from Galilee in the north, Sea of Galilee, in the, in the area where he had great popularity and momentum and entered the region of Judea from beyond the Jordan and large crowds followed them. And look what he says. And he healed them there. So his healing ministry continued on. We've been looking at family ties and I've been doing some metaphorical stuff, but I noticed that in Matthew 18 and 19, where we've divided these texts, we had the problem of broken relationships with children. And there was a great judgment pronounced on those who violate children. I'm calling it an exile. Exile in the Bible is God's means of judgment. He sends us away. If you're in, if you're in Eden and you sin, you're pushed out into the hard world. If you're in the promised land and you sin, you're sent off into Babylon. When in all of these texts, the, the major issue of, of disqualifying sins, of, of sins that violate covenant, of sins that, that uh, do damage to the covenant family, exile of some form always results. The final judgment is a final exile. It's the, it's the being sent away from the God you do not want and will not hear. And there it is. And so broken relationships with children, better for you to have a stone tied around your neck, be cast into the sea than to be found in that position. And then the problem of broken relationships with our, with our brethren. And I, I, I not only did that, dealt that with the family, but I dealt that with uh, the fact that we have, our, we have our biological families. Nowhere are the ties tested more than the biological family. It happens over and over and in a repeated way. But in the, in the church family, what ultimately happens to those to, who continuously violate covenant and will, they, they either get sent away or they actually send themselves away most of the time. And um, what I want you to stop participating in is disciplining the whole church when things don't go your way. You know, um, go tell your brother his fault. It does not mean start a blog. <laughs> Can we talk? All right. Then tonight, the problem of broken marriages. Man, I'm, t I'm squeezed already. The problem of broken marriages. What happens when a marriage is broken? Divorce is the exile from your marriage covenant. So in all of these cases, there's a separation that comes. There's a, there's a judgment that comes. There's a saying that you, you cannot do this here. So marriage. And the Pharisees came to him testing him. Now, you have to understand, there was a debate going on between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or not, wrong, not right, incorrect, between schools of the Pharisees. The, the Hillelites and the Shemites about divorce. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? The, the liberals have said that in, in Deuteronomy, it says if your wife uh, displeases you, they, that's the way they interpret it, you could send her away. And, and uh, so they say, is it lawful to send one's wife away? The other group said, no, no only in extreme cases. Now, what Jesus does is remarkable. And it's time for us to get hold of this inside ourselves. Even tonight, it was interesting. I had a, a, one, a, a wonderful but brief conversation. Um, if, if, if you don't understand how significant and important the, the text of Scripture is, and I'm going to say specifically the inaugural text of Scripture, those first chapters of Genesis... Wow. Jesus goes straight there. He answered them, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them? 
and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. This word, uh, don't be confused about the Bible. Moses wrote this after it had happened. So when I say to you, this word about not about leaving father and mother, understand the place it's sitting in the book of Genesis is before, you know, the first man and woman didn't have a father and mother. <laughs> Got that? But this text is there for us. A man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. I might not get past here, just because I don't want to anyway. <laughs> but, I'll, but, I, but I will have to. Look, what did Jesus do? He said... When you're looking at the when you're when you're looking at the things that have gone wrong, go back to the blueprint. What was the blueprint? Well, we had our first. What was the blueprint? And he goes back to Genesis. I, listen, I can feel it already, so let me just go ahead and say it. Nobody who's divorced is getting condemned tonight. That's not what this is about. That's absolutely not what this is about. I, I am a pastor who receives people as they are. In fact, let, let's, let's, do what, let's do what Jesus did. Woman of Samaria comes to him. He prophesies over her. Go, he says, go get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. He says, you have said well, for you've had five husbands, and the guy you're with now, y'all aren't even married. Now, catch hold of this. What did he say to her? You've had five what? What was Jesus doing? He was saying she really had five. They were married. In other words, you're married. Don't let somebody try to invalidate your marriage. And that's and none of this is for that. Got it? Got it? All right. All right. I'm insecure. You have to talk back to me. And, and I understand how painful this is. You know, I'm standing here, and I remember so clearly being with my great professor as he was preaching through the gospel of Mark. This was 1978. And we were going over these texts, and he was in a little Baptist church outside of Memphis, Tennessee. I was his driver, and I can remember how powerfully these things penetrated my spirit as we were dealing with them. And I know, I'm not, listen, I'm not unaware. I've made plenty of mistakes pastorally in this area. You, you haven't lived until your mother hears you preach on this stuff and says to your son, are you saying that I'm living in adultery? Can we talk? You haven't lived until you, until you look at your mama. And she starts speaking in tongues. Above the, blah, blah, blah. And you get some of the things that you're... you're look, when I, got, when I got saved, I wanted to fix all marriages. Guess what I found out I haven't been able to do? I, I've managed to fix one. This because I have a generous partner. And the context of this passage is what? The, the massive level of forgiveness, of forgiveness, of forgiveness, of forgiveness, of forgiveness. So I, I recently read an article when I was getting ready for this. And the, the article simply said, so can I get divorced or not? He said, that this is, this is what, what, what people want to know. And I stand exactly where the author of this article stood, which is this. The issue is not justifying ourselves. The issue is living as a people lavishly forgiven by a generous God who knows our frailty. 
And Jesus is, is just simply not allowing these teachers to mess with him. And so he says, let's go back to the blueprint. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Lots of times when I talk about marriage, people will say to me, there's all kinds of marriage standards in the Bible, and they'll immediately bring up polygamy. And every time, here's where I go to, in the Bible, the Bible goes back to the beginning intentions of God. And sooner or later, what God does is he accomplishes in history his plan that was from the beginning. In the meantime, we live as recipients of grace, not as, not as perfect keepers of a law. And I know when I, when I come here, and listen, by the way, I'm really okay if, you, if you're going to feel some pain tonight because I feel it. I'm a pastor and I feel it every day. He answered them, have you not read, he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. They're not two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Let's talk about the marriages that are here in this room. Because that's where I'm after. I started, I started seeding the ground for this months ago. And then Heidi Baker came along and, man, she blew up the place with, remember that word that got released over marriage? Marriage is oneness. Oneness means the, the connection is so intimate and so complete that there's no separation. People ask me all the time, when you guys have a, a, a difference, who, who, who settles the argument? And I always answer the same way. I don't have any idea what you're talking about. That is not how it's lived out. It's lived out in oneness. It's lived out in coming togetherness. I'm going to say this right now. I can't, I, listen, I can't fix people's history, but I'll tell you right now, if you are in an unconnected marriage tonight, it's time to get it connected. It's time to take an honest look at each other in the face and say, we're not very connected, are we? What are we going to do? Because if you've been connected, you can get connected. And if you've never quite been as connected as you want to, then welcome to my marriage. Because that's where we were for a long time. And, and you want to talk about breakthroughs? There's your breakthrough. To where you come to the time when you're no longer striving but resting in what you've received. Does it come instantly? I don't think it does because he says here, become. There's a becoming that happens immediately and there's a becoming that happens over time. And both are good. And so, um, and so let's, let's deal with the creation, the original intention. We go to Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 and we deal with the original intention of God. When Gail and I got married, we, there, there was a song that was really popular, that old Paul Stuckey song. You remember that? Some of you... <laughs> called the wedding song oh yeah I was if, if I'd have had time for a long sermon tonight you'd have got it played for you because it's because uh, I'm very sentimental about it he is now to be among you at the calling of your hearts rest assured this troubadour is acting on his part the second verse is the one I have in mind a man shall leave his mother and a woman leave her home. That sounds pretty biblical. And they shall travel on to where the two shall be as one. As it was in the beginning is now till the end. Now listen to this. The woman draws her life from man and gives it back again. Do you not know that that's the creation story? And this old pop song about marriage that drew from the imagery of the, of the Bible. And God created, and he said, good, 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 good. And there was the man alone, and he said, this is no good. It's wonderful. 
It's wonderful. And then he took her from him. And literally, if you, if you colloquialize the Hebrew, when he fashioned the woman, the man looked up and said, that's me. That's me. And then the woman in specific, she's the woman, and then she gets a name, the mother of all living. She's the life giver. Fellas, you're marrying the life giver. Your job, like Adam, is to give your life to her. This is the intention of God. To give your life to her. And then she gives it back, for sure. This is so important to me. See, I want to talk about marriage more now. I, I don't even want to talk about divorce. I have to. Unless I manage to preach so long, we don't get there. I listened to a fellow preach for an hour on this, and he never got there. It was interesting. When, when Gail and I were getting married, see, I was a pretty new Christian. Saved in 72, married in 74. I started reading my Bible. When I started reading my Bible, I got two things. I got my commission for life. And I got, I know how to do this. Now, knowing how to do this and pulling it off are two different things, all right? In other words, I got the understanding, but the, but the doing it took some time. Now, I'm annoying to men because I'm always on the woman's side. No man dared say amen. Did you notice that? <laughs> I noticed that. I read to you as the service started, those of you who were here, and it wasn't enough, so I'll rephrase it. From Ephesians chapter 5. I went over to Ephesians chapter 5, and I said, well, how can I understand this marriage stuff? And... Everybody always starts with, with uh, wise people start with verse 22, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Real knuckleheads start with verse 22, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. I always start right here, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And what? And gave himself up for her. That's how you be married. What did Adam do? He gave his life. She came out of him. She was from his life. This is the way the old rabbis would tell it to you. What do we do now? You want to sustain a marriage? Give her your life. Stop worrying about getting her to do what you want her to do. That's a fool's errand. That should have been more laughs. Give yourself up to her. And when I was reading this passage, Jesus was teaching me both how to fulfill my calling in this world and how to successfully navigate marriage. I come from a family where there's been lots of divorce. My mom and I were talking about this even this afternoon. And at the same time, uh, if, you, if you came into my family, the marriages that have ended up coming out of our family are long, thriving marriages. I had some siblings that had some early divorces, but the marriages that then came later have been long marriages. And so uh, the, family, the, the family status ended up being chaotic in those, uh, especially in those years of the 60s and 70s. But very sustaining and Gail and I are one of the few there's only two, two families in my, in my big family that haven't been divorced and it's the two of us now part of the reason was because when I started off I said this ain't gonna happen and, and I was certain that that meant to me that the, 
the, the biggest weight of this thing is on me. Sometimes I hear about violent arguments that people have. Gail and I had a conversation about this this week. And we realized we never had, we never had that. She told me off a few times, as she would tell you because I needed it really badly. But we didn't have violent arguments. We just didn't. And I learned that if I wanted, but listen, if I wanted her to give her life to me, I had to make it able to happen. And so the way for marriage to, to work is husbands love your wives. Well, how does, what does that look like, Christ in the church? Christ in the church, it looks like that. Can, I want you to know, if you read your Bibles, you're going to find out about the church, that it was no better in the first century than it is now. I used to hear people that would um, lionize about the, the, the early church. It's balderdash. They were petty. They fought. They had theological conflicts. They had personal rivalries. They had, can we go on? <laughs> they, had, they had everything that you have and I have in the church today. And Christ is still giving himself for her. Let me tell you something about, about why we're in the mess we're in. We're in the mess we're in because Jesus wants the kingdom to come forth and we're in the not, we're kind of in the not yet stage. There's, there's three entities I would talk to you about. The state, which regulates divorce. The church, which administers marriage. And the kingdom, which is higher than both. The church is part of the kingdom, but the church is, a is an expression of the kingdom, not yet. And that's why we're working at this thing. That's why we're not satisfied, not satisfied. We're not where God's taken us. We're not where we're going to be. We have not arrived at home yet. But in the kingdom, just understand this, in the kingdom, there's no divorce because the church is the glorious church. Can we talk? Can we press for it? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish in the same way. It's so amazing. He's talking here about language and we're, we're like bl blasted. He says in the same way, you husbands, you should love your wives. Uh, you love her as you love your own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh. You say, well, some people do hate their own flesh. They feed it. They don't hate it completely. He says it right here. He says, he, he says, no one hated those own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. We look out for ourselves. Just as Christ does the church because we are the members of his body. So, by the way, here's what God did in me on this. Number one, he told me that my whole life was going to be with his church, ministering to his church, the word of God, nourishing it and cherishing it as Christ did his own church. He told me that's your life. That's your assignment. Get over yourself and do what I'm telling you to do. And I was like, have you seen her? <laughs> right? So he gave me that assignment. Marriage is easy. By comparison, I'm so blessed to be married to this woman who has saved me a thousand times and saves me still and who, who deals with me. But my wife will tell you that her favorite word is cherish. I didn't teach that to be her favorite word. I just did it because I read it in the Bible. 
And I read it as the way Christ is treating us. Do you know that Christ is here nourishing you, cherishing you? You are his body, his bride. He's patient with you. He's long-suffering over you. He's not giving up on you. He's not giving up on us. He's washing us tonight. He's cleansing us tonight. He's forgiving us tonight. He's abundantly giving himself up for us tonight. We go on in this passage and what Paul ends up doing, he says, well, this is a crazy, this is a mystery, but he says, but I'm talking about Christ and his church. And he gives us the image of how he loves his bride to be the image of God's plan in the marriage. Now, look, we get all broken up. We don't, we get shut down in our lives and we, we forget how to receive one another. We get hurt and offended. That's why, listen, the passage just before this was what? 70 times 7 forgiveness? Marriage only works by forgiveness. It only works by continual washing of forgiveness. That's the only way it works. So when Jesus is being challenged by them about divorce, he takes them to the essence of marriage. I've got four minutes. What is y'all's problem tonight? I'm listening so slow. I really did this, didn't I? I refuse for you to walk out of this place under any spirit of condemnation, but under a spirit of the living Christ who is so giving himself for you so that you can give yourselves to one another. When the Bible says for a wife to submit to her husband, you know what he's asking her to do? Accept his love. That's, that's Ephesians 5. What you're being asked to submit to is the way Christ loves his church. Men, what you're being commissioned to do is to wash her and bathe her in that kind of thing. Well, one of the things that happens in life is the sower keeps sowing no matter the condition of the weather or the soil because he must get a crop. Keep sowing. Keep sowing. Now, let's really quickly touch because I, I didn't get there to all the reasons I needed you to make your babies run away. I just didn't get there. They said to him, why then, then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away, exile? Do you notice, do you notice the tiny shaping of the truth in this question? He said to them, no, 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 no. And he goes back to Moses. He says, okay, you won't go to Genesis with me. I'll go to Moses with you. Because of your hard hearts, Moses permitted you. I remember the first time I had a teacher say, no, no, Moses didn't command divorce. He permitted it. It was never what Moses wanted, never what God wanted. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, and then here we go into this hard peace. Whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And that's where we get in a twist. And I'm so glad I'm out of time. <laughs> no, I, I bet you will forgive me for keeping you a minute or two. Okay, so he says, whoever divorces his wife, except, so what you don't understand is what Jesus did was, he said, no, we don't want to talk about your question in the beginning. We want to talk about the, my pur God's purposes. Then we'll entertain your question. When the question did come, Jesus, in this passage, if we understand this passage correctly, he si settles with the side that is on extreme measures. Very, in other words, rare. Now, what do we have here? 
I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality. The word sexual immorality in the Greek language is a Greek word, pornaya. Echoes, echoes. We've grabbed that word, haven't we? We've employed that word in our culture. Um, one of these days I have to talk to you about, um, I have to talk to you about pornography because here's the deal. Uh, pornography is the Me Too movement of how women are being horribly abused in culture. Uh, the devil's weapon for abusing men and women, but I'm telling you men are being raped, is pornography. Okay. Now, being ugly and angry about it won't fix the problem. But the word here is pornaya. Now, the word had a specific application. The specific application was this. When a woman was married and she was found to have violated the marriage bed, they used this word pornaya. Okay. The word also had other usages, but in specific, they used this word. This is what was believed to have happened when Jesus was born of Mary. Joseph is betrothed and Mary is found to be with child. And Joseph says, I'm not going to put her to a public shame. I'm going to quietly divorce her. And what this would mean in the ancient world is it meant that the, the, the money, the money gift to the family, the dowry would be forfeit back to the, back to the family. Well, Joseph makes this decision because Mary has seemingly violated the covenant. And of course, we know how that turned out. <laughs> the angel comes along and says, you're making a big mistake here. And he receives her. And then Jesus' whole life, he lived under this shadow of the whispers. And he was... And he bore it, and Mary bore it. Because when people accuse you, all you can do is bear it. Trying to prove that you're innocent, forget about it. Well, so this had a specific application, but why? So let's just really quickly, except for sexual immorality, and Mary's another commits adultery. That word is moikia. It's a specific word for this. Usually what happens when the male, it's really usually applied to the male violating the marriage covenant. Now, <laughs> adultery is this. It's the breaking of the one flesh union. Any way you slice it, someone who has been married and marries another person is in that act breaking the one flesh union. Now, some preachers have inferred they are, that therefore those people are living in a state of adultery and cannot be forgiven. That's just hogwash and balderdash. That's why I gave you the example of the woman who had had five husbands. God obviously didn't treat her that way. And he came to her with the greatest message and story of grace ever. So if your question is, so can I get out of my marriage and, and, have, and have no stain whatsoever? No, you can be forgiven. You can be washed. You can be cleansed. And listen, there's not one person here that's not living in the state of forgiveness. We're not living in the state of adultery. We're living in the state of forgiveness. Don't move out of state. Don't, don't leave the place of giftedness. Also, what, what did Paul, Paul would have heard this and he would have said, oh, some of you are going to turn around and say, well, then let's just sin more. And then he says, no one who has the spirit of Christ thinks like that. No 
no one. So, here's the end of the matter tonight. Divorce and remarriage breaks the one flesh union. God never wanted you to experience the pain of divorce any more than he himself ever wanted to experience the pain of his people committing adultery against him. But he did, and we have. And his mercies are new every morning. And you're never going to get anything preached from this pulpit but the mercy of God and the love of God and the favor of God and the restoration of God. And when you act stupid, I'm going to tell you off. (laughs) Because that's what we do in a family. Now, I don't have time for all that. And the disciples said to him, if such is the case with a man and his wife, it's better not to marry. He said, not everyone can receive this saying. I love this. Only those to whom it's given. And then he says some people who it's not given to. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth. Meaning there's some people born, literally born, and marriage is no issue for them. They're not going to get married from birth. It's really interesting, and I'd like to talk about this subject someday. I don't have time now. And there are some eunuchs who've been made eunuchs by men. Lots of us, me included, believe one of these was Daniel in the Bible. That Daniel in the court in Babylon was made into a eunuch. God seemed to use him pretty well. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. I do not think this means people who emasculated themselves any more than I believe this means people who poked their eyes out. I think this means people who have laid down the rights and freedoms of marriage voluntarily to devote themselves fully and unreservedly to Christ. For the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who's able to receive this receive it. Would you stand together and I'll finish. This is about the most I've violated you in a sermon. What a night to do that, right? Then the children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. I was doing a Bible study this morning about John chapter 1. There's children and there's children. There's children who are literally little ones. And I think Jesus is bringing the little ones into the conversation. Or I think Matthew is intentionally saying, this is the time to talk about the little ones. Because we started off talking about the little ones and their abuse. Now we need to talk about the little ones and God's favor over them. But I want you to also know that it is God's will that each of us should be children. And in the gospel of John, it starts by saying, as many as who believed on him, he gave them the right to become the children of God. A very specific word for little ones. And it speaks in the same passage of an only begotten son of God. One unique son who makes all of us his children. The disciples rebuked the people, but see, Jesus said, let the little children come to me and don't hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. I spoke to I'm going to break all my rules tonight. Can I do it? I want my gray-headed men who will to come up here. The three I named and the others. If you're gray-headed, if you're a gray-headed man like me, or if you're, listen, Yoli, and you don't have gray hair, but you should. (laughs) You're my ministry team. Come down here. Come down here. Come down here. And line up across here. If you will, you don't have to, but if you will, if you will say, well, how do we figure that? Well, if you're over 60, for sure, you're involved in this. Hallelujah. 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 Here's what I want you to do, men. I want you to bless God's children. And so here's what I want you to do, church. Anybody who wants a blessing, that's the ministry tonight for your marriage 
for your family, for your own children, for your future, for your destiny. Come and be blessed. Come on, church. Come receive a blessing. Jesus bless them. These men are going to bless you tonight. They're going to bless you. They're going to bless your children. And listen, if it gets crowded up here, line up behind them and wait till they give it up and then get your blessing. But get your blessing tonight. (laughs) And anyone who's come under the spirit of condemnation about divorce, stop it. That is not here. It's not in this house. I won't have it. Shake it off. I won't have it. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And if you've never given your life to him, come up to one of these men and say, I want to give my life away to Jesus. They'll pray for you. They'll bless you. And it'll happen tonight. I've already spoken the corporate blessing. May the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. If you're new, go greet, go see Mama Gail. She wants to hug you and bless you.